and we will read again from verses 22 to 27. We are on week two of the blessing, so stay with us. I know that the Lord has a word for you today. Numbers chapter 2, beginning with verse Uh, Sorry, Numbers chapter 6, beginning with verse 22 all the way to verse 27. So open your Bibles there. And while you're doing that, like I said, we are having communion in a little while, right? After this word, the word, we will have communion. Uh, In fact, this is a very special communion day for us because it's our anniversary, church. We are celebrating our sixth (laughs) birthday. You know, if you're on human beings, sixth birthday, that's when you start the first grade, right? And so we're just beginning to grow, church. And so I'm so grateful for that. We have experienced, experienced a lot of growth in the last few years, but there's more for us. Amen. We're believing that. And also, today is Palm Sunday, like I said. And um, it's also the beginning of the Jewish Passover this week. And so it's very poignant and very, very meaningful to be able to gather around the table of the Lord on Passover. Remember that the, the first, well, the last supper of Jesus was actually during Passover. So this is a very meaningful time for us. Numbers chapter 6, beginning with verse 22. The Lord spoke to Moses saying... Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the people of Israel. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So shall they put my name upon the people of Israel, and I will bless them. Last week, we learned that when God gave these words of blessing, he gave it to a people that was just beginning to experience freedom. They were just beginning to discover what it's like to be free. And he gave these words to the spiritual leaders of Israel, and God said, this is how you bless them. This is a command. Thus, you shall bless the people of Israel. This is a blessing. And like I said last week, This has become the staple, the standard words of blessing for both Christians and Jews for the longest time, for thousands of years. And so we're grateful that God gave these words to us, that we may be able to claim his goodness for our lives. When the spiritual leaders received this, like I said, they, the people of Israel, were just beginning to explore what freedom is like. They were slaves for 400 years. Imagine slavery for 400 years. I want you to think about this. Can you imagine how it's like to be born a slave? Think about it right now. Can you imagine how it's like to be born a slave? It's hard to imagine. Why? Because you and I were born in freedom. We were born and raised in a completely different environment, which gives us a totally different worldview. So we can try to imagine what it's like to be born a slave, but it's hard. It's so difficult because our worldview is shaped by our upbringing. We don't have slavery in our upbringing personally. I don't have that. And so I'm not able to comprehend the depth of what it's like to be born a slave. But 400 years of slavery, the people of God were in. I sounded like Yoda for a moment there. But that's 40 generations of slavery. That's 40 generations. If you count 40 years as one generation, so that's, that's not just you, your, your parents, and your grandparents, and great-grandparents. That's four. You multiply that by 10. That's a long time. 400 years of slavery. And 400 years of a very long time to cement, to solidify into place a lot of bad mindset, a lot of bad speech, bad habits, unhealthy outlook in life, issues, curses in the family, brokenness, and sin. That's a lot of issues cemented for 400 years. That's generation after generation of a messed up worldview and a way of life. Because here's the thing, our worldview dictates our way of life. The way we see things dictates the way we live. What you believe dictates how you live. And so when God set them free from slavery after 400 years, 
he had to change their worldview first. God went back to the elementary teachings, to the elementary part of, of, of life. You have to be weaned off, people of Israel, from slavery and that slave mindset so that you can walk into your new life, so that you can walk into your freedom. Because what you believe dictates how you live. If you believe that you're a slave, you will live like a slave. And so God is saying, I need to change that mindset. I need to redeem my people, not just physically, but mentally and spiritually. How did God accomplish that then? How did God change their worldview? Number one, it's through revelation. Everybody say revelation. The first thing God did was to reveal himself to the people of Israel through Moses. Think about it again. 400 years of slavery, that's a very long time. And they had no clue who God was. They had no clue who the God of their ancestor was. They did not know the God of Abraham. Now what does Abraham have to do with the people of Israel? Abraham was their ancestor. Abraham used to be known as Abram, meaning exalted father. He was a pagan man in the Middle East who, with his wife, struggled to have children. They struggled with infertility for a long time. No matter how they tried, they could not have kids. But out of the blue, God stepped into Abraham's story and called him and said, I will make you a father to many nations. I will make you a father to many nations nations. And Abraham stood up and, and took just his faith and just staked it on what God said, the promises of God. It's amazing how God revealed himself to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12. I will make you a father to many nations. And Abram received a name change from Abram, which means exalted father, to Abraham, which means father to many the revelation of God changed Abraham's worldview. That way of life that he used to live was totally changed. And he began to walk in God's promises and followed God's ways to the very end of his life. In fact, before he died, he made sure that the promised son that he had, he had from, from God, Isaac, he taught Isaac who God was. He made sure that Isaac had faith in the same God. And then he passed away. Isaac tried his best to pass on the faith to his two sons. And one of his sons, Jacob, struggled so hard with faith. Struggled so hard with his relationship with God. So for a long time, Jacob did his own thing, followed his own ways, and oftentimes deceiving other people for his gain. That's what Jacob means. A deceiver. He tried to do his own thing and make his own way in this world. But God, everybody say, but God. But God graciously stepped into the life of Jacob during a time when he was, be, he was doubting the sense of call in his life. God showed up in the form of an angel. Imagine that. And that angel invited him into to a fight, really, to a wrestling match. He wrestled with God all night, according to the Bible. You find that in Genesis chapter 32. That wrestling match with God symbolized Jacob's struggle with faith. Why did God have to do that to Jacob? Because he needed a revelation from God so that he could have a change of worldview and that he could have a change of life. And so after that wrestling match, Jacob named the place where that happened Peniel. Literally means the face of God. The word for, for face in Hebrew is pan or pene or panav. Peniel, Peniel means the face of God because it was there at that point. He was able to see who God was. A revelation that changed his life. We need a revelation from God for us to be able to experience a change in the way we think. I love what God did. He had a vision. God gave Jacob a vision of himself face to face. We all need to have that kind of personal revelation. I grew up 
in a very religious family, in a Christian family. My father was a pastor, but I needed to have a personal encounter with God, which God gave. I received a lot of teaching from my parents, and I thank, I'm thankful for that, but I needed to have a personal faith, a revelation of God. And I'll, I'll share that story maybe in the future. But we all need that kind of personal revelation. Eventually, one of Jacob's sons became a prominent leader in Egypt, Joseph. We had a sermon series about him. Joseph, after becoming one of the most famous and prominent people in Egypt, he invited all of his brothers, all of Jacob's sons, to Egypt to live there. But here's what happened. They grew to a, a point where the people of Egypt were threatened because of their presence. They were growing in numbers so much. And so the king of Egypt, who did not know Joseph, or who did not recognize Joseph's authority, put the people of Israel under slavery. Now, where did the name Israel come from? We go back to Jacob. When he had a wrestling match with that angel, God changed his name to Israel, from Jacob to Israel. That's why we've been talking about the people of Israel or the children of Israel, B'nai Israel, the children of Israel, because God changed Jacob's name to Israel. But from then on, here's what happened. By the time Moses was born, the children of Israel has, had no clue who God was. They have worshipped the gods of Egypt. They had no clue who the, the God of Abraham was. And so they worshipped Horus and Ra and Isis and Osiris and Ammon and many others. They had no clue who Yahweh was. Now how did that happen? If Jacob had an encounter with God, how could his children not have faith? How did they lose it? Here's what happened, I think. We can only surmise or assume that Jacob's sons failed to teach their children about God. And that is why spiritual parenting is so important. Your role as a parent to be a disciple maker is so important. For your children's sake, be a disciple maker. Be your children's discipler. Because here's the thing. If you don't teach your children who God is, they will either stop believing in God or someone else will teach them who God is and it may not be the one true God that you know. It could be the God of money, the God of sex, the God of career, the God of addiction, the God of this world. It may not be the God that you know. So it is your role to be the teacher, to reveal God to your children. Let them know what God has done in your life. That's why at baby dedications, and this is not a sermon on parenting, at baby dedications, we challenge the parents and ourselves as a church community that we will come alongside each other to raise our children in the knowledge of God, to teach them the, way, the word of God and the ways of God so that the way of God and the word of God and the spirit of God will dictate how they live, their way of life. And it will form their worldview that will honor God. The Bible says in Proverbs 22, 6, Train up your children in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. I'm so glad I got some training from my parents. There were times when I tried to depart away from what they taught me, but because I know that the, the constant, the only constant in this world is God and His love for me, I always came back. We always will come back if we know the gravity and the beauty of the love of God for us. And here's what I love about the story of Jacob and his children. Even though the children of Israel failed in their responsibility to teach their children about God, God was still gracious to reveal himself to the next generation. So by the time God revealed himself to Moses, this is what God said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. I have always been here. You have forgotten who I am, but I am calling you back. I am calling you back. I'm going to reveal myself to you in amazing ways. So to change the worldview of Israel from slavery to freedom, God needed to reveal himself to them again. Because the only true revelation of God is the key to the great foundation of true freedom. Let me say that again. A true revelation 
from God or about God is the true foundation of real freedom. See, the more revelation you receive, the more freedom you experience. Revelation is powerful. So God changed the way Israel behaved or thought. that He changed their worldview and their way of life from slavery to freedom through revelation. But the second thing he did was God gave them a revision. Everybody say revision. Revision literally means to look again. Israel needed to review their life. We are slaves. We're born slaves. But we need to look back Look back at our lives. Is this where we're called to be? Is this our permanent position? Think about it, COVID. Is this permanent for us? I say this is not normal. We will go back to, not go back to normal, but we will actually grow better. Amen. We will be free from this one day. But God needed to recondition the, the mindset of the people of Israel from slavery to freedom. Reconditioning is needed. So revelation comes first and a revision happens. God taught them again who they were. I am the God of your father, Abraham, the God of your father, Isaac, the God of your father, Jacob. You have to know that you are special. You may have been born a slave, but you are not meant to be a slave forever. I need to change that, God said. God needed to teach them what life is really all about, what their purpose truly was, and what his promises were to their forefathers. God gave them new rules and guidelines that will protect them. God gave them uh, something that will govern their thinking and their way of life and position them for greatness. That's what God does when he changes our lives, when he asks us to look at our lives again, when he reveals himself to us, he is repositioning us for our original purpose in him. I want you to turn to your neighbor right now and say, God is repositioning you for your destiny. For your destiny. So how, God, how did God do that? How did God bring revision to the people of Israel? First of all, he opened their eyes to new realities. New realities. They were no longer slaves. That's the new reality. No longer slaves. So stop looking at yourself as slaves so you'll stop behaving like slaves. You got to stop that. There are things you need to give up. There are words you need to stop saying. There are places you need to stop going to. You are no longer slaves. You're no longer bound to your past. But it takes a lot of work to recondition your mind, yourself to your new reality. That's why when Moses was leading the people of Israel through the desert, all the way to freedom, they were adjusting to their new reality It was so difficult. There were times when the people of Israel wanted to revert to their old ways. In fact, some of the people said in Exodus chapter 14, verse 12, we were better off as slaves in Egypt. Can you imagine that? They believed that their old worldview, their old way of life, what they were used to, was better than their new reality. Why did they think that? Because it takes a lot of work to revision your life. Because like I said, their worldview has been stuck in slavery for 400 years. Their beliefs, their, their system has been solidified. Feels like there's no way out of it. But God was leading them out of it. You are no longer slaves. That your, that's your, your new reality. I love what the Apostle Paul said in Philippians 3, 13. Abigail preached about this a few weeks ago. I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. Embrace your new reality. See things past your past. So God gave them new realities and he also gave them a new spirit. New reality without new spirit is impossible. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, it says, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. You can never embrace a new reality apart from embracing a new spirit. You can't. The spirit of slavery has to die so that you can walk in a life of freedom and favor. Stop living like a slave. See, God wants to set us free from the 
the spirit of judgment. You're no longer living in the shackles of your past. This, this life that you're living, you're no longer trapped in generational judgments and curses and issues that your family has been carrying for the longest time. Everything that you think is a curse in your family that you're still carrying now, you can drop them. Right now, you can be free from all these judgments in your heart and mind. From now on, you can walk in the spirit of obedience and freedom. You are no longer paying for the mistakes and sins of your ancestors or your parents. Just because they made a mistake doesn't mean you will do the same thing that they did. Yes, you will make mistakes, but your children don't have to do that, to, to, to follow your, your, your footsteps. They can be free too. You can be set free. So free yourself from that mindset of judgment. Kill the spirit of judgment and, and embrace the spirit of favor. And here's the thing. You can embrace the spirit of favor not just in your life, but for the generations to come. Teach your children what it's like or how to be free. Another thing that God wants for us and for the people of Israel at this point is the freedom from defeat. Embrace the new spirit of victory. Stop walking in defeat. Stop thinking that your past life still has a hold on you. I'm like this because I did that. No, God can set you free from that. God can set you free from your past. And therefore, you can walk in victory. Kill the spirit of defeat. Embrace the favor of God and the spirit of victory. Another thing that God set people free, his people free from, is the freedom from discouragement. Stop living in discouragement. Have you met people like that? Always discouraged, always long faced, always bringing the storm and, and the, the, the gloom into a party or something like that, right? You can live above your storms. I love what the, the book of Isaiah says that those who wait on the Lord, will mount up with wings like eagles, and they shall soar. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I love the example of the eagle. An eagle is, is the, well, the eagle is the only, I think, bird in, in, in this world that can actually soar above storms. That's who you are. That's who you are. You want to be free from discouragement. Embrace the blessed life God has for you. Stop with the anxiety. Stop with the depression. Stop with the negativity. Embrace joy. Yes, the world around you is bleak and a lot of bad news are going on around, but that's not going to discourage me from smiling. Can I hear an amen? That's not going to stop me from sharing God's love, from helping people and being a blessing and walking in my anointing. Never let discouragement keep you from walking into your destiny. Kill the spirit of discouragement and embrace the spirit of courage and joy. Another thing that God brought to the people of Israel was freedom from fear. As soon as Israel walked out of, of Egypt into freedom, the king of Egypt changed his mind. If you read your, the story of, of, of the people of Israel in Exodus, you will notice that the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, said, no, no, what have, what have I done? Get them all back. So he sent his army to pursue the people of Israel. Here's what happened. The people of Israel, living in their freedom, realized that the army of the Pharaoh was running behind them, and right in front of them was a sea. And you know the story. You've all seen Prince of Egypt, right? God opened the sea. He literally created a roadway through the waters. So that his people can walk into their freedom, literally. And when everybody has walked across, God closed the sea. And that symbolizes God closing the past. The past is past. You're ready for the future. You're ready for the future. So no longer live under the shadow of your former masters. Don't be afraid anymore. I will be with you, says the Lord. But you know what? Fear has a way of creeping back into our hearts, right? It's crazy how that happens. And so somebody says to me, Pastor John, how do you, how do you address fear then? Every time I feel afraid, what do I do? What is the opposite of fear? Somebody says courage, right? Courage is not, the, well, courage is the opposite of fear. 
But to address fear, you don't need courage, you need love. What, pastor? Yep, that's what 1 John 4, 18 says. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear. How does that happen? When you see and know how much God loves you, you never have to fear anything ever again. You never have to fear economics. Why? Because you know the promise of God that He will never leave you nor forsake you. By the way, that verse is about economics. It's about finances. God will never leave you nor forsake you. God will provide for you. God loves you. If you know how much God loves you, Jesus said, here's the thing. God loves you so much. The the, the flowers of the field... They don't do anything, but they're clothed by their Heavenly Father. I'm not saying that don't do anything. But there, there's a time, there's a season like, like now, that you can't do anything, but you don't have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid, for God is with you. Perfect love drives out fear. The people of Israel needed to hear that, because for a long time, they felt alone. Yeah, there were two million Israelites that walked out of Egypt but they all felt alone. They all felt insecure, but the love of God gave them courage to walk on. That's what you need, the love of God so that you can walk on. And so together, revision, revelation and revision have their equivalent in our lives as Christians because these were given to the people of Israel. But what is the equivalent of re- revelation and revision for us? It's number one, salvation. Salvation. The, the, the revelation of the Lord leads to salvation, but revision has to do with sanctification. I know that's a big word, but sanctification means it's God's work in us to change the way we look at things and to change the way we live. Salvation and sanctification. Now, what does, have to, what does that have to do with the second part of the blessing that goes, the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you? Here's the thing. The face of God has everything to do with revelation. Remember the story of Jacob? He named the place where he wrestled with an angel, Peniel, for it was there he saw the face of God. The face of God is about revelation. And so this blessing in Numbers chapter 6 verse 25 the Lord make His face to shine upon you. What, is, what this is saying is, may God reveal Himself to you. May you receive a revelation like no other. The Hebrew word for face is panav, like I said. Ya'er Adonai panav elecha. May the face of the Lord shine upon you. May you receive a revelation from God like never before. And the second part is, and be gracious to you. The grace of God. See, revelation is His face. Revision is His favor and grace. Revelation is about knowing God deeply and intimately. And that revelation leads us to deeper experience of His grace in our life. That's why we need continually to seek the face of God, the revelation of God, so that we may live out and walk in His favor. May His favor be upon each of you listening here right now. And the only way for you to walk freely in your anointing is to see your life through the lenses of God's favor and love for you. Through His lens of favor, you are not judged, you are not defeated, you are not discouraged, you are not afraid. Because perfect love casts away all fear. I love what... 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 to 18 says, the Apostle Paul said, but whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Literally, the, the word there is apocalypsis, which means unveiling to reveal revelation. For the Lord is the Spirit, and wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed We can see and reflect the glory of God. Beautiful grace of God there, hey? And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more. Everybody say more and more. Like Him 
and we are changed into His glorious image. We are changed into His glorious image. It's His revelation that leads to a change in our lives. Question for you is, how is God revealing His face to you right now? In this season of COVID-19, when the world is in chaos like it is now, how is God showing His favor on your life? And finally, the, the last question I have is, what is the purpose of God's revelation and His favor for your life? Why is God blessing you? Why is God favoring you? Look at Psalm 67. This is our last verse for today. Psalm 67, verses 1 and 2 says this. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make His face shine upon us or on us. That's a reflection of the blessing right there. But there's a purpose. The words, so that. Everybody say, so that. Your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among all the nations. Revelation leads to revision. And the reason why God keeps blessing you and blessing his people is so that more people will know his salvation. Are you living that out? Has anybody come to know God because of your blessed life? I pray that you will be a blessing and that your life will shine so that people may know God for who he tr truly is. We are going to have communion. And if you don't mind, Jason, if you can pass that alcohol gel towards here <laughs> so that I can have my communion ready. Thank you so much. That's Jason right there. He's one of the greatest guys I, I know. Uh, as we celebrate communion and our sixth anniversary, it's powerful that we get to do this in a time of pandemic to remind us that the church is not a building, the church is not a, a location, the church is people scattered throughout this world and for here, for us, scattered throughout Lloyd Minster. And even though we're not celebrating in a big way, I say this is grand as well. We may be in a small room, and a small, that's not even a table, but we're celebrating the grandness of God's love for us. So if you have your communion elements with you right now, I want to lead us in a time of communion. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, took a piece of bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke the bread gave it to his disciples and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Eat this in remembrance of me. So if you have your bread right now, go ahead and partake. This is the body of Christ, broken for you, for your salvation. After supper, Jesus took the cup, and again he gave God thanks and praise. He gave the cup to his disciples and said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. It will be shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you can in remembrance of me. If you have your cup, go ahead and drink. This means team you can't have communion with me right now <laughs> very simple very ordinary God the Lord Jesus Christ used the simplest symbols to convey the most powerful act in all of time and eternity the sacrifice of his son on the cross Lord Jesus, so grateful, we're so grateful that in you and through you, according to the Apostle John when he wrote John chapter 1, that in you and through you we have seen God. And through you and your work we continue to see God. 
not physically, but through our spiritual eyes, we grow more and more in love with you as we grow in our knowledge of you, as we recognize that you love us. Lord, I love what the Apostle John said. We have seen God's glory in Jesus. The glory of the one and only, full of grace and truth. So God, as we close this time of worship, I pray that you have been honored in the way we worshiped and the way we respond to the word that was delivered to us. And Lord, thank you that we get to move on and continue to walk into our freedom as we see more and more of you in our lives. Lord, I pray for more revelation for the people of God because the greater revelation, the greater the witness. We're so grateful in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We don't want to close this worship experience without inviting you, anyone here who's watching, who wants to trust Christ as Lord and Savior. We don't want to end this worship without asking you and inviting you that you can actually experience God's revelation in your life. If you want to receive Jesus as Lord and Savior, this is what you do. You receive Him through prayer by simply acknowledging that He is Lord and He is Savior. He will reveal Himself to you in amazing ways and He will give you a revision, a new way of life. In fact, the Bible calls it new life. Just new life. Do you want new life? Receive Jesus today. Pray this prayer out loud with me wherever you are. Lord Jesus, today I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I acknowledge that you died on the cross more than 2,000 years ago so that I may be saved. But you also rose again from the grave to give me victory. Jesus, I acknowledge you now as my only Lord and Savior. That through you, the Father, the creator of the world, is revealed. I want to know more of you, God, through your Son, Jesus, and the power of your Holy Spirit. In your name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer for the first time today, you have just started a relationship with God. You, in a way, had just received a revelation from God, and your journey to freedom has just begun. Stop doubting that God is at work because He already is. So here's the thing. If you gave your life to Christ today, we'd love to invite you to just let us know on Facebook right here. Just say, I gave my life to Christ today. Or just write, today I received Him as Savior. Please do that for us. We would love to connect with you and send you a gift so that we can appreciate the fact that you have actually become a part of the family of God. And now let's all stand to receive the blessing of God. And I will pronounce it in English. The Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now until we meet again, God bless you all. Have a merry, merry week.